Okay, good morning. 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 Uh, we have a very special presentation today. Um, I just wanted to welcome all our uh, veterans, coffee house veterans, and yes. And we're starting off like we start all our meetings for the Pledge of Allegiance. Diane, would you be good enough? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Pastor Marty Schott of New Hartford. Uh, Marty is kind enough to bring our special guest in this morning. It's, uh, it's a long trip from New Hartford. And uh, go ahead, Marty. Just hold that close. Yeah, sure. Well, good morning. Good to be here this morning. I wish I could say I'm a veteran. I'm not, but I like to let you know I'm a patriot, and I'm always appreciative of those that uh, went to uh, service for us and uh, part of uh, our military family, and I'm glad that, uh, to be in front of all of you, of course, this morning here. And it's good to have the Hortons with us. I wanted to just take a moment to say hello to, uh, rather, regards from Mark Halliday. He wanted to be here, but uh, he's uh, indisposed, I guess is the right way to say it. He'll be with you next month, I believe. But again, we're glad to be here and uh, good to be amongst uh, so many patriots. I want to give you just a uh, reminder, I know I'm talking to an educated crowd this morning, but uh, 70 some years ago in World War II, I have some statistics for you that I think are very pertinent that we know about. 36,260 United States soldiers were imprisoned in Japanese prisoner of war camps during the war. 13,381 died in prison camp, that's 38% of all men that went into prison camp died in the Japanese prisoner of war camp. 13,996 civilians were also, that's the United States civilians, were also uh, imprisoned in Japanese war camps, of which 1,536, which recorded, died, or 11 percent. Uh, in contrast, 127 Japanese Americans were interned in Japanese camps in America here, and of course I found four atrocities, so four murders. Uh, so to assign moral equivalency to uh, nations is intellectually bankrupt at least. And the land of the rising sun, although they're our friends now, in 1940, not so much, of not course. So much. And so we're honored uh, this morning. I've heard the Horton several times, and it's good to have Dr. Jalen Horton with us, of course, and he's going to close us in prayer here at the end. But Audrey is a, is a, has a wonderful testimony. I want you to know that profiles and courage are not just with American soldiers, and certainly millions now can claim to have that courage, and some have paid the ultimate sacrifice, but also with Olympic gold medal winners who won't run on Sunday, and she'll tell you the story, I'm sure. But also, profiles and courage are with nine-year-old girls who go off to prison camps without their parents. And with that said, Audrey Horton, let's give her a big hand. Audrey, we're so glad to be make sure that you can hear. Uh, it's a really a great, great privilege to be with you today and close to July the 4th and our, our uh, American heritage there. Veterans have a very special place in my heart. You put, you, have put, you put your lives on the line for us every day when you served our country and you are still serving us in the capacities where God has placed you. And the veterans, and we'll hear my story, gave me my freedom, which was so important. 
I am thankful today for God's faithfulness in my life. And now I'd like to ask you a question. Do you think that God can be trusted all the time, no matter what happens in your lives? Most of you watch or you listen to the news over the media, or you read it in the newspaper, and you're reminded almost daily of the terror of terrorism. You're reminded of 9-11 and the threat since that time. Shortly after 9-11, we were traveling in our car, and we heard someone talk on the radio. The question was asked, if you had died on 9-11 in that terrible, terrible disaster, what would you want to be remembered for? What would you want on your tombstone? In June of 2001, my husband, our oldest son, Norman, and I stood on sacred ground in a family burial plot on my dad's side of the family in a small village in Norway, the land of the midnight sun. We stood in front of the tall, dark granite stone which marked my paternal grandmother's grave, and we read the inscription on it. The words engraved on that stone were so simple, yet so profound. Chad Amor, Tapura Visa's way to Yesu, Dean Barn, a speaker barn. Dear Mother, thank you for showing us the way to Jesus, your children and your children in law. And Psalm 112, 6, the righteous shall live in everlasting remembrance. Here lay the remains of a a woman who had lived to be a hundred years old, she had reared eleven children in a tiny sod roofed home, and her influence had reached around the world. Due to her influence, my father finally yielded himself to God. He who had gone into an evangelist meeting in a crowded farmhouse with the sole intent of looking in the preacher in the face to ask why he, as a Baptist preacher from America, dared to come to their Lutheran village and tell them they were sinners, why they were good church members, and they had their infant baptismal certificate and confirmation certificate to prove it. He had never heard a Baptist before. There was barely room for some of the rebellious youths to squeeze inside the door, and the rest had to sit outside. That night, after the convicting message, the Baptist preacher looked right back at my dad, and made his way all the way to the back while my dad was trying to get out the door, but couldn't because of the press of people. The evangelist put his hand on the shoulder of that rebellious, red-headed 18-year-old that night and said, Young man, are you saved? And my dad answered, No, I am not saved. He knew then with a shadow of a doubt in his heart that his baptism and, and confirmation could not save him. He knew he was a sinner and needed a savior. The preacher asked him, what time do you want to be saved? My father said, right now, I want to be saved. And down on his knees he went right there in front of his family and his friends. And the preacher prayed for him. And my father was gloriously saved. And a mother's prayers were answered. He came out of that meeting a new creation, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.27. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The next morning, Tuesday morning, the 28th of August, 1910, Jacob, my father, set out to turn the world upside down. He dressed in his church clothes and his oldest half-brother, Solomon, said, What on earth do you think you're doing? Jacob said, I got saved last night, I'm going to tell all my friends about it. And he did. His first friend said, oh, Jacob, you did wonderful last night. It was just like it was real. God believe, said my father, it was real. I have peace and joy, and you can have it too. And God believe, was the first fish he caught, a real seal head. That week, my father led 28 of his friends to the Lord. He was not called the cowbell of that northern village for naught. Two of his friends became preachers, even one coming to America. Can God be trusted? Is he faithful when he calls you? My father was to find out. Psalm 118, the Lord is on my side. What command do unto me? After completing Bible school and pastoring, my father went on the Trans-Siberian Railroad 
to China through Russia in 1917, not knowing that the Bolshe Bolshevik revolution was raging. He barely escaped with his life and what few belongings they had left him. But he was carrying a message from the Norwegian consul in Norway to the Norwegian consul in Shanghai, and he had that tied to his chest. He said they would have to kill him first before that message would be lost. I want to say that God is faithful when we give our lives to him. No matter what happens to us, God can be trusted to direct us, and he will always be with us. What if my grandmother had not been faithful to her Savior? What if my father had not been faithful to his Lord? Then I would not have had their godly influences in my life. My grandmother faithfully prayed for her 50 grandchildren and in-laws as they were added to her family. We all have choices to make. Do we want to make a difference in this world for God, or do we want to give up? and give in to the materialistic worldly pressures that press on us from every side. Psalm 71, verses 17 to 18 say, O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not until I have shown thy strength unto this generation, and thy power to everyone that is to come. My mother grew up in the prairies of Nebraska to Swedish immigrant parents. She had two weeks notice to sail with the family to China in 1919. The man's first wife and two daughters had been killed in the Song and Song Revolution, and he was going back with a new wife and the remaining daughter. My mother's father and one brother gave her a total of $400 a year to live on. She received her passport the day before she boarded the ship in Seattle to sail to China, her first view of the ocean. She met my father in China. My father took his new bride to his home in the heathen village of Sanyang, Shenzi, southwest of Xi'an, now known for its terracotta figures, where he and another bachelor had been the very first missionaries to enter into Satan's territory. Mother was the first <coughs> married non-Chinese woman to enter there. The Chinese were amazed that she was a married woman as she had such big feet. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, the women then had to have the bound little three-inch feet at that time or they would not get married. My father was so ugly as he had such a big Scandinavian nose. And they both had those blue eyes that they were afraid of, because those blue eyes could look through mountains. The only house my father, who was called a foreign devil, had been able to lease, had been a horse stable, as no Chinese would live on it, as 18 people who had lived in that house had been killed by demons. So it was a testimony that they lived in that house without the demons attacking. The Bible says, greater is he that is in you, than he that is in the world. We saw the outside of that same adobe mud house in 1940, 1997, where two of my siblings were born. And that is where I bought this jacket. Missionaries then had long terms. When my parents' first term of six years when my father was finished, they were on their way home to meet each other's family in Norway and America. They had their darling one-year-old son with them who was the joy of their lives. On the trip, he became suddenly ill with infectious cerebral spinal meningitis. They traveled 11 days before finding a doctor in a hospital, but the illness was too severe. On that little gravestone, they, they engraved Erling Gerlob Nordbull, born March the 9th, 1922, died March the 24th, 1923. Budded on earth, blossomed in heaven. During their furlough, they had a little girl born to them in the United States named Evelyn Jeanette. They took her to China. She was a little angel who loved the Chinese. She would go out in the streets, and she'd take the Chinese by the hand, and she'd bring them in the house and say, Now, Mommy, you tell them about Jesus. And Mommy was very glad to tell them about Jesus. When Evelyn was three years old, she was very ill with malaria. Blackwater fever. 
Mother was also ill with reoccurring malaria and she was expecting my brother Sandy. Chinese carriers were carrying Mother and Evelyn. All missionaries, hundreds of them, were fleeing to Chifu, now Yentai, in Chongdong province from the communists who started there in that same province. Then they were caught, the communists were determined to kill them. Evelyn was so concerned about Mother. She would say, Mommy, how are you feeling? They were among the first guests one night at a brand new Chinese inn. The last words little Evelyn said to my father were, Now, Daddy, you rest, because you're very tired. Then the death angel came for the three-year-old golden-haired Evelyn to take her home to the Jesus she loved so dearly. The Chinese had said she was too good to live. They never said that about the rest of us four. <coughs> In the morning, my parents brokenly picked up the straw suitcase with the precious body of their little darling. They couldn't let on that there had been a debt in that inn, as it would be closed permanently for business, plus they would have to pay a huge fine. They traveled until they came to a, a burial ground where 11 martyred missionaries men, women, and children who had been killed during the Boxer Re Rebellion had been buried, and there under cover of darkness, they buried their earthly body of their precious darling in a suit, straw suitcase and a hastily dug grave with no stone waiting for the resurrection day. You might say, how can you serve a God who would take their first two children who's whose bodies today are still lying in Chinese soil. Our daughter Crystal, second child of our seven, lost her husband, a 17-year-old daughter, our son-in-law and our granddaughter, half of her family, four days before Christmas in 2003. She said, Our God doesn't make any mistakes. He knows what is best for me. There are no what-ifs. There's no blame or anger. The Lord has done this, and he does all things well. He has done it for my good. On her husband's gravestone, which is their joint one she put on there, and in thy book they were all written, the days were ordained for me. On her daughter's gravestone she put, Gracious friend. God is faithful. We can become bitter or better. God gives us the bumps to climb on. God didn't promise smooth sailing but he did promise a safe landing. He promised to be faithful, true to his unchangeable character. In 1997, my oldest brother paid his siblings way to China to visit our roots in Shenzhen province, our parents' mission work in China for the first time in 50 to 60 years. All we four siblings met Chinese Christians who knew our parents, and some knew us who were still meeting in the same church buildings who were still preaching the same gospel, even though it meant hardships, discrimination for jobs, and death at any time. <clears throat> if they witnessed to Chinese off the church property, they could be imprisoned or put to death. We also met three sons of our father's evangelist secretary. Our mother had delivered one of them and saved his life and his mother's life. Those sons did not want to pay the cost of giving their hearts to God. The one whose life had been saved had been the head of the Communist Party in that town. How short-sighted they were, as Satan is a tough taskmaster, and hell awaited them. And thus they changed. I'd asked the Lord into the heart. The pastors told us that many more were coming to church than when my parents were there. They had to hold six services on a Sunday to accommodate all the people. Praise the Lord, the seed had been sown and had multiplied. God's word will not return void. Lives have been laid down for the gospel's sake, but God is the one who has given the goal of the gospel. And it was worth it all, and it is as it should be, as it's the Chinese who are spreading the gospel, a completely indigenous church. The song says it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Where would those precious Chinese be if Christians had not risked their lives for the souls of the Chinese? I can just imagine the welcome my parents had when they went home to heaven in 1981 for my father 
and 1990 from my mother, from all the Chinese Christians from China, where they had ministered for 30 years, Indonesia for 11 years, Tahiti for 11 months, and Taiwan for 4 years, and Christians from other countries. How wonderful to have all those crowns to put down at Jesus' feet. He is worthy. My father summed up his life in three words, trust and obey. On their joint gravestone, the inscription reads, they preach the gospel worldwide. Though our family spent more years apart than together, they instilled in us God's faithfulness and that God is not only to be trusted, but also obeyed. Now this morning I would like you to imagine that you are currently living in an enemy occupied territory. Daily you know that your faith is in the hands of your conquerors, which happen to be the Japanese. One day you hear a knock on your door, you look out, and what you have been dreading to see, you are looking at. A smartly dressed Japanese soldier standing at your door, waiting for his orders to be heard. Your hearts are beating rapidly. You hardly dare listen to the words coming out of his mouth, but you have to do so as your future depends on what he is going to be telling you. And what you hear sends chills up and down your spine. You are ordered to pack your belongings as you are now officially prisoners of the Japanese Imperial Army. They even have a new home for you to go to. And you are to be in that new home in an hour. In that one hour that they have give, so kindly given you, you have to choose what you will take with you for the next years. How many years is anyone's guess? All the rest of your belongings will be lost to you forever. Would you still believe that there is a God that cares for you and that can be trusted? That scene actually took place with the foreign business people who lived in the coastal town of Chifu, now called Yantai, Shanta province, across the Yellow Sea from Korea. But in the same town, on the opposite end of the beach, there was a school compound started by J. Hudson Taylor, where the China Inland Mission English boarding schools and missionary houses were. That is where I, a nine-year-old student who lived in the preparatory school, and my 12-year-old sister who lived in the girls' school, and my 15-year-old <coughs> brother who lived in the boys' school were living. It had already been three years since we'd seen our father, and two years since we'd seen my mother and younger brother. They were in the interior of Shenzi province serving the Lord, and we were in occupied territory already, even before Pearl Harbor. It was too dangerous to travel one to another. God was gracious and gave our missionary teachers, missionary families and us, six days to gather our belongings. How would you like to pack for around 200 school children? There were well over 300 total from the missionary school community that were, be, were to be moved into three and a half family houses. Talk about downsizing. There would be some clothes, mattresses, bedding, school books. What a horrendous task. We had been under house arrest in our compound for 11 months since Pearl Harbor wearing armbands for identification when given permission to go outside our walled-in compound. Americans had an armband with an A, and when the Japanese weren't looking, they would turn it around for the Victory B and uh, cross out the, the, the little bar across there. British wore a B, and the smaller countries had a character, as I did as I was a Norwegian citizen at the time, and it's basically saying, I promise to obey the commander or the Japanese. This is a typical Norwegian brooch I have on my jacket. This was a stressful time as the Japanese took our headmaster from our compound and imprisoned him along with other influential foreigners whom they interrogated as they thought they were spies. Our headmaster had adamantly refused the Japanese soldiers' request to use our girls as their comfort women. Hourly and daily prayer was offered on their behalf of the, of the prisoners. 
all were released after six weeks a miracle except for one Christian businessman whose family was met at the door with a box full of his ashes, a Japanese tradition, not a Chinese tradition. The Japanese had immediately claimed our buildings <coughs> as theirs as soon as they won at Pearl Harbor. They lost no time in starting to remodel them for their purpose as a naval and army base while we were still living there. They even had a Shinto priest came and pray over our property, which was very revolting to us because it, it was God's property and God still retained the ownership there, in spite of what they, they thought. But my sister and her friends actively prayed that a certain wall that the Japanese were build, building would fall down. And guess what? It always did. God was strengthening their faith. The day came November the 5th, 1942, when we had to leave our familiar surroundings, which are today a naval base, for the Chinese to go to our new home at Temple Hill, where we could see the Chinese diligently going to the temple to fruitlessly worship idols which have eyes that see not and ears that hear not. And we were reminded why our parents were in China as these spiritually blind people so desperately needed the gospel. We children had left our buildings carrying favorite possessions. Most of our toys were left behind for the Japanese. As we were walking to our new homes across the town, someone started singing, God is still on the throne, and he will remember his own. And then one of our teachers had put Psalm 46 to music. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will we not fear the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob, and that was my father's name, the God of Jacob is our refuge. What a testimony that was to our Chinese servants who were weeping and to the hardened Japanese soldiers that our God was more powerful than our circumstances and worthy of our praise. We again had the choice of becoming bitter or better and our teachers who replaced our parents were making sure that we knew that God had not forgotten us. He makes no mistakes. He is in control. He has not promised us carefree life, but he has promised to be with us when the trials and the tribulations come. He said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And best of all, the prayers of God's people all over the world were upholding us. The first thing that was noticeably different as to routine, and which was a reminder that we had completely lost our freedom, were the daily roll calls. When the Japanese lined us up in a double row and they would call up Bengo and we would call up Ichi Nui San Shibo Rokasu Chiyachi until they were through and we were through counting. After 11 months of 358 people living like sardines in six Presbyterian missionary family houses, our house held 72 people. My, se my sister's semi-detached house held 100 people. The Japanese moved us to a larger prisoner of war camp, two and a half days journey on a very small boat where 250 of us were stuffed into the stench-filled hold with the rats and the cockroaches crawling on, over on us. Then by train and truck to Weishan, now called Weifang, where the site we were to call home greeted us with its formidably high walls, electric barbed wires, six watchtowers, Japanese these centuries with fixed bayonets and children shepherd dogs. We were ushered through the gates which closed behind us for two whole years and we were issued our prisoner of war numbers which we wore all our waking hours. I was in block three and my number was 33. It had been a Presbyterian Bible training compound with the name Courtyard of the Happy Way which had been a premium place to live. Henry Luce the one founder of Time Magazine, he had been born there, and Pearl Buck, author, had lived there at one time. But the compound had been trashed by a succession of soldiers prior to the arrival of the first group of prisoners of war who had to make life functional from the garbage heap. The, the Japanese guards lived in the walled off section where the missionaries had lived. Families lived in 9 by 12 rooms, and single people had to be crowded into classrooms with complete strangers 
and no privacy and had only 18 inches between one bed and the bed on the other side, a three foot on the end. In that little world of nine feet by 54 inches to keep all of his or her worldly belongings. There had been 2,000 prisoners in an area of 150 yards by 200 yards, a little over a city block. 500 had been moved, so that made room for us. Then later that year, in 1943, there was a prisoner exchange and most of the Americans and the Canadians had been sent home, but I was Norwegian. We had other prisoners come in later, so our number remained at 1,500. What were the living conditions like? They were filthy with a capital F. Open cesspools. One little boy happened to fall in that open cesspool and just about drowned. And uh, if somebody had to rescue him, and his name became Cesspool Kelly for the rest of the camp life. Rats, flies, and dead bugs, and mosquitoes. How did we survive? You learn to make the best of what you have. One of our leaders wrote, Wei Shen, the test where a man's happiness depends on what he has or what he is, on outer circumstances or inner heart on life's experiences, good or bad, or what he makes out of the materials those experiences provide. Flies were so numerous due to the open cesspools. To make it more exciting, we held contests. One great-grandson of Hudson Taylor, no, today a noted surgeon, won one contest having killed 3,500 flies all accounted for in his bottle. And rats, my brother and his friends won that contest when they killed 80. The coveted prize was a can of sardines. Bed bugs were a constant menace. We could never get rid of them no matter how hard we tried. One schoolmate had the patience to count 500 on his bed one morning. We didn't have pesticides. Our missionary teachers who substituted for our parents gave us security by never burdening us with any of their fears. They made sure we had structure, financial, <coughs> school, chores, good manners, kindness, and helpfulness. Chores had to be done, water pump, vegetables peeled, maggots scraped off the meat, clothes washed and hung up, wintertime they froze on the line, that was my job. Our washcloths in our rooms were frozen in the morning when we went to use them. Coal balls were made out of coal dust with our children in hands. The Japanese kept the chunks. We had the hottest summers and the coldest winters. Summertime, we tried to keep our feet off the hot spots. Shoes were kept for the winter. Miraculously, the Japanese allowed us or gave orders for us to function as a small community where our leaders were accountable to the Japanese soldiers. It, many of our prisoners had come from the colonial area and had lived in China for years and were very, very wealthy. It was just like a big drag that had gone through that area and scooped everybody up. And so we had some excellent, capable men who were good CEOs in their, in their vast businesses and now became our CEOs in the camp. So they did a very good job of controlling or trying to control the camp and we were blessed with that. One thing we can really thank the Lord for, that we as prisoners did not suffer physical abuse from our Japanese captors. Why? We, I don't know, other than God's people all over the world prayed for us, the people in our camp. Prayer does prevail, and God chose to answer those prayers. We were allowed to have school. That was not standard. Some had to write their own textbooks from memory to teach their camp students as did Eric Little, the Scottish Olympic gold medal runner of, uh, 20, of 1924, Chariot Sapphire, remembered him, who refused to run his 100 meter race on Sunday. It was the Lord's Day, and he spent the Lord's Day in Paris preaching at a church instead of being at the Olympics. On Thursday, he won the bronze medal in the 200 meter race, and on Friday, he competed in the 400 meter race and won a gold medal, and set a world record, which held for several years. He was not part of our China Intermission School, 
but he was our camp sport organizer and instructor. He had sent his wife, who was pregnant with their third child and whom he never saw, and their two girls to her relatives in Canada in 1941. He was God's humble servant, and he loved to speak from the Sermon on the Mount, and he emphasized, forgive your enemies. It was a sad day when he died on February 21, 1945, of a brain tumor at age 43, and the war was over in August, and it took three months for his wife to hear that he had passed away. Our high school boys were the honorary pallbearers, as the coffin of our Uncle Eric, as we all called him, was carried on a bitterly cold day with the Siberian wind howling around the coffin to the little cemetery in the Japanese section of the camp where 30 other prisoners lay buried. There at the lonely grave, marked with a crude cross written with Eric's name written on the shoe blacking, Stephen Metcalf, who had been given Eric's patched up running shoes, from the Olympics in 1924, three weeks before Eric died, promised God that he would take up Eric's baton of forgive his enemies. He kept that promise and was a missionary in Japan for 40 years. He has now recently joined Eric in heaven. Eric had said, when you hate, you are self-centered. When you pray, you are God-centered. Pray changes your attitude. It is hard to hate those you pray for. He being dead, yes, speaketh. While Eric was known for his dedication to God and others, his impact on life such as mine is still having an effect. Do you want to live a life that will still be having an effect on others after you've died? You can if you give your life completely and unreservedly to God. Today at the former campsite there is a large marble stone from Scotland honoring him and they have added a life-size statue as well. The actual gravesite has long since been covered with a robe. Along with a bilingual obituary on this statue is a fitting text. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. The Chinese have made a memorial park at the former campsite honoring all of us who had been prisoners there. They have made a long marble wall with over 2,000 prisoners' names on it. Yes, my name and my siblings' names are on that wall. Our bedrooms were our classrooms. We rolled back our mattresses and sat on them and wrote on slates when we didn't have notebooks that we used over and over again. And we learned. My older brother took his Oxford exams in camp and had to wait a whole year before he he found out that he had passed. He became a pathologist. Our teachers diligently taught us with their limited supplies and decreasing health. You might say we existed with our food. Us and Taylor's 80-year-old son lost weight down to 80 pounds. Each year, the quantity of food was, de was decreasing, and we were slowly star starving. If we had stayed another year in the camp, there would have been many deaths from of starvation. Most of the Red Cross packages that were meant for us were confiscated. I think we may have got one during that time. In the morning, we might have some kind of cooked Chinese cattle grain porridge with nothing on it or water-soaked dried bread. No milk to drink, but only Chinese black tea, no sugar. Lunch and supper were SOS. Same old stew, watered down the second meal. Kit Kitchen cooks had to scrape off the maggots off the meat when we were given meat, no refrigeration. But we, as in our school, were not allowed to complain. God had provided the food, and we were to eat it like we were guests of the King of England's table. Mind your manners. One time the kitchen vegetable crew had peeled potatoes for kitchen one and left them overnight in the kettle full of water. After cooking the potatoes the next day, they emptied them into a serving bowl uh, to feed, to feed the, uh, the prisoners and discovered that they had been boiling rats along with the potatoes. So what to do? Well, doctors to the rescue. We boil the potatoes, throw the rats out, of course, and then feed the 800 pris hungry prisoners because you won't get any other food. So we ate those potatoes. 
And then another time, the guards brought, brought a dead horse into camp and wouldn't let us butcher it until it was putrid and rotting. The Japanese said that their purpose was to humiliate us. No man liveth unto himself. Don't ever forget that everything we do or don't do is, has a connection to people around us. I was under conviction for my sins. Being a missionary daughter didn't make me a Christian. One day when I was 11 years old, Miss Pearl Young, a Canadian teacher, took each one of us aside in our small class and talked with us personally about our souls. That is what I needed. I knew I was a sinner. I confessed my sins and was saved. After the war, she and a co-worker, Mrs. Sess, were within five minutes of being buried alive and they already dug grave by the communists who had, who, when God delivered them due to missionaries having their afternoon tea in another part of China, being prompted by God to stop and pray specifically for these two ladies, and they were saved from that horrible prospective death. I do not believe I wrote my parents about my salvation as our letters were dictated to us. We were allowed to write 100 censored words, including the addresses once a month on a special form, further limiting the correspondence was the recipient had to write his reply on the same form. Most letters were never sent from the camp, as it was too much work for the Japanese to censor them. We had 23 to 26 different nationalities in the camp with many different languages. Two very brave men escaped from our camp. There was a dire need for medicine. They joined the National Chinese soldiers and traveled with them one and a half years until the war was over. It took three months before our medicine arrived. In 1981, one of the brave men became the U.S. ambassador to China. The escapees were never further than 27 miles away from our camp, and they set up a bamboo radio system. They would give news of the outside world written on a little piece of silk, which they glued to a cardboard, put it in the typewriter, typed the message, took the silk off of that with the message, and then rolled it up into a, into a little bit of rubber, a, band, a rubber band around it and all, and it was given to a designated coolie who was actually a coolie spy who was coming into the camp to clean out garbage or the cesspool. The coolie would put the pedal up in his nose and blow it out, which was a typical Chinese custom at that time, or in his mouth to spit it out. One time a guard came and a gun put a gun into the coolie's mouth, so the coolie swallowed the news. And the interning who was making connection with this coolie, said, wait a minute, wait a minute, and he says, and he ran to the hospital, got some castor oil, came back and gave it to the coolie, and we got our news. <laughs> and as the coolie was leaving the camp, now he was a spy, he was a double, double agent, he, he looked at the attorney and spat at the attorney, and the Japanese soldier laughed. So the, we had so many people that were helping us, and God, and God was using them to, to help us. You can imagine what the most frequent topic that was discussed was our future liberation, to think of being free again, to go home, and what wonderful food we would have and our mouths would water. We as Christians think and talk about the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our hope, either to be caught up in the rapture or go home to heaven by way of death. How and why, none of us know. What if Jesus were to come right now in the twinkling of an eye? Would you be ready to go to heaven with him? Or would you or I be ashamed at his coming? If you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior, or you need to get something right with God, now is accepted time. Please don't put it off. One hot summer day, August 17, 1945, we heard the drone of an unfamiliar airplane. As we looked up into the sky, something marvelous happened at only 450 feet above the ground. The belly of the glistening B-24 Liberator with the name Armored Angel and an American flag painted on it dropped open and seven beautiful parachutes came floating out and our heroes 
our deliverers, our rescuers from the sky, descended into a tall, eight-foot field of Chinese grain, one breaking an arm. Another one, a missionary's son who had gone to our schools, had given up his FBI post to join the Office of the Strategic Services, what is now called CIA. He and the other five American soldiers had volunteered to be part of the duck team, a special intelligence mission, which in reality was a suicide mission. The former pupil's sole purpose of being included in the mission was to liberate, help liberate his school. Pandemonium broke loose, and we all rushed to the gate to go out for the first time in two years for me and welcomed these incredibly brave heroes who were risking their lives for us. Only one guard was seen raising his, his uh, gun to stop us. We found our seven muscular heroes, six Americans, and one of the Americans was a Jap- American Japanese, and one young Chinese interpreter in U.S. uniform crouched behind Chinese grave mounds, heavily armed with, with guns drawn. We were a motley, ragged, barefooted, emaciated, gaunt crowd that swarmed these seven brave, incredibly healthy men who had their guns drawn. And when one of my classmates reached the soldiers, the major asked if he could lift her up, and he lifted her up and she had on a red sweater and said, now wave to the pilot that everything is well, and the pilot dipped his wings. And so that was a memorable day for that girl. And she had on red, which reminds us of the blood of Christ, which washes away (coughs) our sins. And truly, that was a a memorable day for us with with freedom there. But when the crowd with the seven brave soldiers came to the gate, there were 20 gaping Japanese soldiers who had to decide whether to fire on the seven soldiers. Then the tension was released when the Japanese guards saluted and the liberators were allowed in. It had only been three days since the war was over, but the peace treaty was not signed yet, and it was believed that the Japanese soldiers had not received orders from headquarters. The duck team had heard that there was an order on the books for the Japanese to kill all prisoners, if they lost the war, and that order was true. Also, they heard the communists wanted to take over our camp. Plus, there were some guerrilla soldiers, groups, who wanted to capture us and use us for hostages. So it was imperative for them to get there immediately. The major with both guns drawn entered entered into the office of the Japanese commander demanding that the Japanese commander give up his samurai sword and the gun to the major and recognized that the American soldiers were now in charge. After a solemn pause, the commander laid his weapons on his desk, and then the major gave the weapons back to the Japanese commander and said, we need you to work with us for the safety of the prisoners and their repatriation. Well, the very next day, an American plane was sent to pick up the seriously ill prisoners that were in the camp but they could not land as as there was 200 armed Japanese soldiers at the airfield. The plane had to turn around and leave. The major was furious and he confronted the commander, commander, uh, Japanese commander, demanding that he do the job that he asked to do, which was control the soldiers that were all over the place, the, the Japanese soldiers. And he did not want that episode to be repeated anymore. Oh, what a glorious feeling to be free. That is the way when we receive the freedom of Christ, which he gives us through his death, burial, and resurrection. And we repent of our sins and give our lives to him. And our courageous heroes are being remembered in the Price of Freedom display at the Smithsonian and in one of the two prisoner of war camps displayed, for through their incredible bravery, they gave us our freedom. We were the first large group of 500 to leave the camp when the Chinese communists 
blew up the railroad tracks, and all the rest had to be flown out. During this time, the reality hit home to people. Most had no homes to go home to anymore. We were put on a cargo ship heading for England, then Norway. When our ship anchored out in the waters at Chiron, Sri Lanka today, we three siblings were called to the captain's cap cabin and told that we were disembarking all by ourselves as our mother and younger brother were in Calcutta, India. What a shock and surprise. So we three had to go down a rope ladder into a little boat to take us ashore. Our mother and younger brother had escaped from war-torn China and had been in India for a year. And prior to that, my father did a, a very great service when he was in China because he was the liaison for the American soldiers in that area. And my father had spent two years in the military in Norway, and he was a very, very patriotic person, and he loved being used or being able to help the Americans in that way. Calcutta at that time was not safe for foreigners as India seeking independence from Britain and my mother was braving those terrible streets to try and find out where her children were at that point. We were flown on a mil U.S. military plane to Calcutta. We three siblings amid the soldiers and we had prayed that we'd get a plane flight and that was our first plane flight and it was it was wonderful. The plane landed in Calcutta, but no mother and younger brother were there waiting for us. They had not been notified of our arrival, so what to do? A soldier suggested that we ride the military bus into the big city, which we did. We were dropped off at the Colonial Grand Hotel. We stood outside the Grand Hotel with our pathetic belongings, feeling like forlorn orphans, having no home and no money. Taxi drivers came up asking if we needed a ride. We said, no, we don't have an address. We don't have any money. <coughs> Had God brought us that far and forgotten us? One of the soldiers again took pity on us and told us to go into the hotel where a gentleman in an office might be able to help us. And guess what? It turned out that the man in the office had been in contact with our mother and knew she had been moved into the viceroy's house which was being used as a clearing center for ex-prisoners of war. When we met our mother, she said she recognized her two girls. I was 12 at the time, and my sister was 15, as we had on now ill-fitting dresses she had sewn for us five years before. She thought my brother was a soldier, as he was dressed in army khakis. They, they were glad to, to trade their ragged clothes for army clothes. Uh, he was a young man of 18 now, and she had not seen him since he was 12 years of age. What a grand reunion, a foretaste of heaven when we will be with our loved ones who have gone ahead of us. Our journey took us to Norway by England. The Norwegian government made our way home to China, and our dear Norwegian grandmother and family had been through the horrible Nazi occupation. My parents had been cut off from any mission funds during that whole war, the whole time that the Nazis occupied Norway in World War II. Was God faithful? Yes, he was. He provided for their needs in many different ways. And guess what? He even arranged for the Japanese to pay for our keep for three years. So my parents did not have to pay for food, tuition, books, nor did they have to buy new clothes for us as it was fashionable to wear patches upon patches. Plus, there was nowhere to buy new clothes. In Norway, my, first, my mother's first concern was our health, and it helped that the king of Norway gave us extra rations of milk because we had been prisoners of war. Our, fa our father joined us for Christmas in 46. We had not seen him for seven years, and my father and mother had not seen each other for two years. He had been in China for 11 years without a furlough. My sister and brother had lived at the boarding school for 10 years without ever going home, and I for five. Our family were strangers to each other. We had to get reacquainted. Six wonderful weeks together, and then my older brother left for further education in the States. And after two more years in Norway, we all left for the States as well. And our entering the States at that time was quite difficult. I was born on furlough in Nebraska. My siblings were born in China, so they were called white Chinese with Norwegian citizenship. So they either had to come in on a visitor's visa 
for a student's visa, but eventually they became citizens. My brother became a pathologist and my sister and younger brother were public school teachers, all being missionaries where God placed them. We four married Christian mates and all four of us have celebrated our 50th wedding anniversaries. My husband and I met in church. We were married eight years and had four children before my husband met his in-laws who came home from Indonesia. Then it was too late for them to say no. <laughs> they had ministered in Indonesia for 10 to 11 years without a furlough. We did not see each other. We never talked on the phone, but wrote letters and sent parcels to them. They came home to three married children and, in, and three in-laws and 11 grandchildren to get acquainted with and reacquainted with. After Indonesia, my parents went to Tahiti and Taiwan to minister to Chinese and missionaries. We never had the opportunity to visit those countries when they, when they were there. We ourselves have been married 61 years. We have seven children, 28 grandchildren, 17 great grands with one more on the way. Our family is soon to number 70. So from the witness of one faithful witness to her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, many hundreds of lives have been reached with the gospel. She truly did what it said. She truly did what it said on her gravestone. She truly showed them all the way to Jesus. What would you like to be remembered for on your gravestone? which will sum up your life and be a memorial forever for others to read. If you've not accepted Christ as your Savior, I heartily recommend him to you. He's been my Savior since I was 11 years old, and he's always with us. We've had many changes in our married life of 61 years, and we are experiencing changes now. But we know we can count on the unchangeable God who holds our future securely in his hand, he will continue to guide us and lead us and use us if we but let him have his way with us. My father quoted, When my life is past, how glad I shall be that the lamp of my life has been shining for thee. I shall then not regret what I gave of labor or money for sinners to save. I shall not mind that the way has been rough, that my Savior led me. That will be enough. When I am dying, how glad I shall be that the lamp of my life has been shining for thee. Will you be able to say that when your life is ended? Thank you very much. sharing your experiences. We're in awe of you and the other POWs that survived that horrible time in history. And we will remember those that did not survive. Thank you. I'd just like to, to mention that next month Janet Barrett will be here. And some of you have heard her. Uh, in regards to uh, her book, they called her Reckless, a true story of love and one extraordinary horse. And this is what the U.S. Marines do on uh, the Korean War. She's a dynamic speaker, and uh, you'll, you'll really appreciate that. Um, lastly, we, uh, we're going to do a restart on the Veterans Coffee House in Cheshire. And uh, our meeting will be on September 19th. Same times as here, 10 to 11.30. And if you can make it, you're certainly welcome to join us. Uh, thank you, Captain Burke. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thanks. And Captain Burke, uh, retired uh, Navy, 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 Naval aviator, uh, flew jets off uh, aircraft carriers, and he runs a program at Quinnipiac University for the student veterans. And we we help with donations to the Student Veterans Lounge at Quinnipiac, and it's a really a wonderful thing that they do at the University of Florida Veterans. Thank you very much, Thank you. Marty. Thank you.
Sure, sure. If you're not familiar with the Chariots of Fire film, that was the 1981 movie of the year. We got to watch it with the Hortons. Of course, I would encourage you to dig that movie up again. It's very, very little. Great story, of course. And, uh, of course, uh, the, the coach there of the, uh, of the athletics department, I guess, in the prison camp. And the Hortons, uh, obviously distinguished folks uh, in their own right, of course. They've been in uh, missionary work for their entire life, of course, 60 years or thereabouts. And uh, Malin, Dr. Uh, Malin Horton, his brother from the record is the president and founder of the Pensacola Christian College in Pensacola, Florida. It's known all over the world, of course, as I think 49 different uh, countries represented, of course, several thousand students. But Dr. Horton, would you come and close us with God's blessing? Yes, Lord, to bless God bless the USA and bless our troops as well, please. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. All right, it's good to be with you today. Uh, I have a brother who is a chaplain in the Army, and he was killed in Germany. His driver drove on the Autobahn, hit his head on. Well, uh, another brother was uh, a male nurse in uh, Vietnam, and uh, he was in charge of. Uh, well, I guess you call it the uh, emergency part. When they brought him in with uh, young men in uh, on the helicopters in the hospital, he had to decide who was able, to, who they were able to save or not. You know, as far as uh, it was a real hard position. And then later, he spent 35 years in the Philippines as a missionary. And uh, much older brothers were in World War II in the South Pacific and. And I was eight years as a well, weekend warrior, I guess, National Guard of Sunset Division in Oregon. So uh, uh, we were all for the service, and uh, uh, this meant a lot to us. So. All right, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Then. Our Father, we thank you for uh, this great country that uh, uh, we have, and uh, we're able to uh, serve and uh, pray for our president and the, uh, the cabinet and all those that, that uh, you direct and guide that uh, we might continue to have the freedom to uh, meet as we do today and uh, uh, to worship the Lord and whatever. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the military and uh, for these who spent uh, years in, in the military. Just uh, encourage them and uh, may they have a desire to know you as personal Savior if they don't. And, uh, we we'll thank you for that, and Lord, we pray, uh, we're so thankful for your willingness to give yourself um, on the cross of Calvary to pay for sin and to offer life to all who trust you, and uh, Lord, we, we thank you for that, and uh, thank you for this time together today, and just direct each one now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>